So we're going to be looking at innovation and experimentation in photography. And so I threw in um, the one piece we had in the 250 um, on Thursday, because I wanted to make sure that we kind of remembered where we are um, in the curriculum. So remember that um, Joseph Leeds, another Frenchman, um, he was working with Gaguerre and they invented a way of permanently capturing imagery on um, metal, glass, and so on. And so remember that some of the very first photography was trying to emulate existing art forms. Um, Nadar, right? Remember the hot air balloon guy? He was the one hanging out of it. He was trying to elevate the status of photography. It wasn't just a science, it was also an art form. And so people like the bear, right, in the image that we have, number 110, used traditional still life material. Um, he arranged it, right, he composed the object, and then he took the photo. Now, there was a little bit of science involved with this because we did know that if you use white objects, your exposure time will be shorter. And shorter is typically better because there's less chance for um, blur or issues like that. Okay, so that was the first piece that we had in the 250 with photography. So the next one that we have is part of what we call motion photography, and it's by an artist named Moybridge. And so Moybridge was really interested in um, looking at movement. And so he invented a machine that could capture what it looked like if a horse was galloping. Because we've seen some really good paintings of horses, and we've seen some really bad paintings of horses. Like if you just, not necessarily in this curriculum, but if you see paintings of horses, sometimes all their legs are flailing out at one time. Um, you know, different legs are down at different times. And so he was able to capture what an actual galloping horse looked like. So we're going to watch this video really fast. I'm going to pause the recording because I'm not sure if it's copyrighted. So we're going to, um, if you're missing, you want to watch. Okay, so you can see that he did more things than horses, right? So when we look at it, right, we have our image in our 250 is one of the horse images, so horse in motion, but I wouldn't labor right? And so he created this new brass praxiscope, right? So there's a vocabulary term for you, right? That's what he invented. That is how he took those photos, right? So you can put this in context. Um, this was a camera that he invented that shot off a series of exposures. So this was pretty revolutionary because cameras, especially the kind of cameras um, that they used back then, were really slow, right? You would have to load individual pieces of film into a camera. And so you could only take a picture as fast as someone could move it. So he created this Zepraxiscope that could take multiple pictures. And you guys are used to this, like it's you know second nature on camera phones to take a rapid fire shot, be able to see a bunch of photos all at once. But this was pretty new. And so that gave us the ability to be able to see, you know, notice how many legs are down when a horse is fully galloping, but also to be able to use photography as a way of holding poses that were difficult to hold, right? So this would be a very good um, system for artists who were trying to hold dramatic poses. You know, if someone's falling backwards, you can't have your model keep falling. You know, you can't capture that quickly in painting and drawing. Um, it was a great way for people to sketch or to have short studies. And then of course, it also helped transform new compositions in new media. So in the video, right, based that's about um, Moybridge, you know, I shouldn't say without Moybridge, but Moybridge led to motion picture, right? So things that we think of as movies and film today. Um, here's a great example of Marcel Duchamp. He's in our 250, but he, um, we have a piece of his that doesn't really look anything like his painting. And this is his painting called New Descending a Staircase. And a lot of 
of artists like him, a lot of the cubist artists, were really inspired by this idea of being able to see multiple things at the same time and show emotion. So notice how in this scene, right, this painting, you see the nude descending the staircase in different stages, right? You can see kind of that emotion, right, or that sense of blur. So this one is probably pretty simple when you're filling out your note taker. Um, the form is just black and white still photography, right? There's no background to it. Um, there's no real composition to it. It's kind of organized in a very scientific fashion, right? The content of it is that we have still the that horse running, right? The function is to show the movement, to be able to see movement. And that kind of context that we just talked about is that it's scientific and leads to motion pictures, right? So when we look at something like this, is it art or is it science? I'll pose that question again. We talked about that on Friday. Would you say that Moybridge is more science or more art? What do you think? I should have made a poll on this one. But I'm not going to do that right now because it wastes time. So what do you guys think? You can throw it in the chat. Is it science or art? I'll ask you in a second. Science or art? We got some both. We got some science. What do you think? He was probably more science minded, right? It doesn't talk about him being an artist, but you know, he was really studying how motion works and it did lead to art innovation. But I don't necessarily think when I look at this artwork, I think high art, right? So here's, uh, it's, I think it's really funny, um, sort of like what we saw with the Dar, um, that he, these traditional subject map. So you saw in the video, we had like, he had that nude in motion. So instead of showing someone in clothing, they showed nude. So here's a female semi nude in motion, right? And then, like I, they showed a lot in the video, but if you click on this link, you see that there's tons of different examples of these motion figures, right? Um, I think this is actually kind of cool too. Um, this is Etan Jewel Mari. And his is very similar to what we think about green screen today. So basically what he did is he dressed a man up all in black and then put like dots and lines on the body. And he was able to study locomotion. So you can actually see how the body bends and moves in space. So you don't really see the person because they're in front of a black backdrop, but you can see that sense of motion. So he just built on Warbridge's um, study in science. Like I said, it works a lot like CG today using green screens to make film. Okay, so the last piece of photography that we're going to look at today is Seagull School, or what we call straight photography. This is a later artist. Um, so straight photography. Does anyone know what that term means? Does anyone take Photography, does anyone know what straight photography means? Straight photography. Okay, so basically, straight photography is when you look through your viewfinder. So let's say I'm using my camera phone, and what I do is I look through the camera and try to move the camera to get the best composition, right? I don't alter it, I don't retouch it, I don't change it, I only photograph exactly what I see. And as an artist, I decide what I'm going to snap the picture on to get that perfect image, right? So the image is what it is. A lot of photographers did sort of like manipulation in the dark room before Stieglitz, right? They would make things lighter, darker. They would edit negatives and put them together. He really just took pictures how he saw it, right? This is the flat iron building in New York City, right? That triangular shape, 
building, and you can see that it's in winter. So pins are like post impressionist pieces. Um, he was kind of a later artist, so we're actually in the time of like people like Picasso by the time we look at Siwa. And so he was trying to emulate a lot of painting characteristics in his photography as well. So the image we have in the 250 is called the Steerage by Alfred Stieglitz. So this is number, sorry, I think it's 1.7. Right? So Stieglitz wants to elevate the status of art, or excuse me, the status of photography, especially the status of modern photography and modern art in the Americas. So he uses that straight photography method, right, to try to elevate the status. So he highly composes looking through his viewfinder on his camera. Okay, so we're going to kind of break that down a little bit. Before Stiglitz, right, these are some of those examples that I was saying. The artist manipulates the objects, takes a picture. The photographer manipulates the people, the lighting to create drama. The, the Photographer manipulates the negatives. Remember, this one has like 32 negatives that compose this image, right? And then we have this portrait photographer, right? So Stieglitz is just kind of carrying his camera around and trying to, to take really good photos, okay? So how does he compose it? When you look at the picture, notice that the game plane, this is the way that people would board onto the ship, at least the upper classes, right? Notice how that game play divides the composition up in half, right? There's a top half, which is that upper class seating on the boat, and then the bottom class seating of the boat. So this would be like first class, maybe third class down at the bottom. Okay, so he, he, when he was taking that picture, you know, he could have put that game plank at the top, at the bottom, but he intentionally chose it smack dab in the middle. So the artist was making decisions. Okay, he was trying to abstract the image in a way. Like I mentioned, he was, he was painting, um, or excuse me, taking photos at the same time and Cubism was being developed. So our ladies of Avignon, right, was 1907. This is the same year. And he was very knowledgeable of European art of the day. And so he was actually recording paintings and showing it at his studio. And so he wanted to extract photography in a similar way. So it's got a lot of strong lines. So the game plate itself is like a visual line, right? The railings are a visual line. The pole here, that kind of mass on the ship, is a visual line. And then, of course, the different levels of the ship as well. And so he had a lot of repetition. So he's looking for that repetition when he's taking his picture. And he's really kind of zooming in. Notice it's not the whole ship, right? Think about traditional photography. Like, we're going to see a picture of a boat. You see the whole boat. He was really zeroing in on just a section of it. Okay. Um, this is actually one of his other pictures. Um, does anyone know it? It's a photo of another zoomed in image. It's of a sky. It's of a sky. So he was really, you know, interested in zooming in on certain sections, right? So the context of this, he took this photo when him and his family were taking one of their many trips. Um, to Europe in 1907, and this image, like thinking about the context and the content of it, is based on discomfort. It's based on discomfort. Um, he felt he was seated in this upper class section, and he felt out of place in the upper class area, right? Um, and he wrote about it, and he, there's actually a section in the Khan Academy that kind of speaks to his discomfort, partially because he was an immigrant to the United States. And so he kind of fell out of place in that upper class because if you look carefully at the imagery at the bottom, it's more images of um, the different classes and we see different um, 
religious groups and you see, you know, different styles of clothing. And so he kind of was a little bit like, you know, I don't know where I belong. Am I this, you know, affluent American or am I an immigrant, right? And so he was able to kind of break it up into those classes visually. Interesting enough that he actually had some issues with immigration. Um, he probably, he had kind of a right-leaning bias and he actually was a very, he was sympathetic, but he also believed that if you were an immigrant to this country, you should be highly educated and skilled like his family. So he didn't want people coming to this country if they weren't bringing things to the nation. And so that's actually talked about in Smart History or Khan Academy as well, uh, which is kind of interesting. But he felt out of place in the upper class, right? He probably felt a little out of place on the bottom class. And so he was trying to speak about that kind of immigration at the turn of the century in America and how he was taking this picture and composing the picture. Right, because his father was an immigrant, um, you know, he's first generation American. Any questions on that? Like I said, you can read some of his own words if you go to the smart history on this for further understanding, right? Now, sequence is really important into modern art becoming more popular in the Americas. He was a friend and a promoter to a lot of European artists of day. So he knew people like Rodin and Cezanne, Matisse, um, and Picasso. And so he brought a lot of their art to New York City. And, it, and there was a very famous show actually still in existence today called The Armory Show. And he basically was one of the major contributors and proponents of it to bring European art to America to show it on display. And so he got, you know, he basically convinced um, the, the government of New York City to use their armory. So this would be for like the National Guard. It's like a big kind of like, kind of like gymnasium, right? And so he, um, they opened it up, they cleared it out, and they used it to display a lot of um, prominent pieces from Europe of the day, which brought a lot of controversy because realism was really the standard in the Americas at this time. So he, you know, was showing pieces like this. And he eventually um, married Georgia O'Keeffe, um, who we'll talk about later in the 250 as well, or later in our study, I should say. Okay, so that's the end of photography. Any questions? Okay. So we're gonna move on to, Impressionism. And so Impressionism was challenging tradition of painting. Um, so that's going to be our focus for looking at the target for this portion of class. I think interesting enough that photography really led to a lot of the changes that we're going to see, see in painting. And so looking at how photography influenced or changed painting. One, it was no longer necessary to paint realistically. If you could snap a picture in an hour, you know, when I say snap a picture, process picture in an hour, why would you spend hundreds of hours painting a realistic scene, right? So that was one of the contributions of photography to painting. Um, it led to new composition. So kind of how with Alfred Stieglitz kind of like looking through the viewfinder, this is an Edgar Vega, and notice how the tables get kind of cropped out of the sea, right? We know that there's more table here, but it kind of is cut out of the image, like it might be cut out of a photo. And so artists started to you know, see this in photography and started to emulate these kind of new compositions. Because pretty much up to this point, a, a painting was like a window into another world. So we tended to see edges of things and so on, right? Uh, we could express the speed of the age. So like this well, Joseph Mallard William Turner painting, you can see an essence of blur. And we got that photography because of those long shutter exposures. And then once again, kind of energy kind of being cut off, right? So we're gonna look at the characteristics of Impressionism. 
we're going to watch a slightly long video. It's like 13 minutes. Um, it's called, um, it's from what we call the art assignment based on PBS. Um, the, the contributor to this is Rachel Uris Green. Um, you might know um, her because she has been um, on like PBS for a number of years. She's got this great website on artists and kind of like bringing contemporary art to um, the general public. Um, she's also married to John Green, the writer, John Green. Um, and sometimes she actually puts him into the sessions as well, which is kind of fun, um, but not in this one. So when we're looking at this video, we're going to look at the different inspiration for Impressionism, the different subject matter, the different style, and what they're concerned about. Because Impressionism was not a cookie cutter. Right, so we're going to look at this. I'll pause once again the recording because I'm sure this one is copyrighted because of the um, PBS, and I'll try to remember to hit pause um, again when we're done. So there's a lot there, but it's just going to give a good kind of overview. So impressionism is really from about 1874 to 1886. And so it really is a group of artists who did not, you know, kind of exhibit in the typical salon. Eventually, they started to apply to salons and get in. But they typically, you know, outside of the salon system, created these exhibits. And they all kind of showed show their work together. And so they had their last official exhibit together in 1886. And so Impressionism, you know, often have works that seem kind of sketchy. Um, there's a lot of different qualifications to um, Impressionism. There's a lot of different aesthetics based on the artist, you know, and what kind of subject matter or compositional characteristics um, were these artists interested in. So styles really range, but they tend to be expressive mark making. And so you tend to see the brushstrokes of the artist, and they can range from really loose to really tight. And a person who, like Monet, did both, right? Sometimes his work were incredibly loose, where you saw these big, broad brush strokes. And then sometimes he would use smaller little dots where it would smooth out the value as well. And so there's all different kinds of marks from dots to dashes to commas to splat to flat kind of brush strokes, depending on the kind of brush you would use. Um, they often rejected um, linear perspective. Now, that doesn't mean that we won't have linear perspective because they got, right? And Cassatt used it all the time in their images. But a lot of them rejected kind of that formal art that we've been seeing since the Renaissance. So showing realism, showing um, typical chiaroscuro. Um, there's a, kind of the three main emphasis of, of um, Impressionist work is light and color and moment of time. And so this was a common characteristic. Some of them emphasized it more than others. So like Monet, um, Claude Monet, you know, he was really interested in the optical experience of light and color. So what I mean by that is, what does the color and light, light look like at a particular moment of time? So what does the color of something look like in dusk? So like really early in the morning. And then what does that same color and light look like at 10 when maybe the fog has lifted? And what does it look like at 1 p.m. when the sun is high in the sky? And then what does it look like at 3 and 6 and then at sunset? And so they were really trying to show things at different times and pinpointing certain moments of time to paint, right? Because they wanted kind of like that perfect light. And this was something that artists had done, you know, Leonardo um, and a lot of the um, Venetian Renaissance painters always liked kind of like dust light. This was something that existed before, but Impressionists really um, strategized their, their painting based on time of day and weather, right? So color was determined by light effects, reflection, and weather. So color could change if it was cloudy or if it was sunny. Right, if it was early, if it was late. Um, they did a lot of visual mixing of color. These artists tended to stray away from black. 
So there will be a few artists you'll see that will use black and gray, but most of the artists tend to use really vivid, rich colors. Um, she had mentioned that a lot of the colors had just been invented. So these colors were, um, were not just coming from nature, but they could also be produced through chemicals. So we tended to get like brighter greens and brighter yellows and brighter blues. And also, um, these artists started to work outside the traditional studio. So we have two paints. So paint that was placed in metal tubes was invented during this time. And so you were able to go outside the studio and you didn't have to laboriously mix your own paint necessarily. Um, so people were working outdoors. And this actually happened in generations earlier with the realists, the dark, the Babazon school, people like Corot and Russ Marley were working outside the studio, right? And then subject matter varied highly based on the harvest. So birth of um, of impressionism. Um, a lot of this was in the, the um, in the video, so I'm not going to uh, record it verbatim. But what I always think is kind of interesting is that when we look at impressionist artwork, it we always think of it as so pretty. It's like so pretty, and it's like you know, there's always these elements of joy and leisure, contemporary life, and it makes us think, wow. You know, if I were living in the late 1800s of Paris, my life was like awesome. But these paintings were a direct um, uh, correlation with the hardships of the Franco-Prussian War. So Paris, right, was in a series of hardships during the Franco-Prussian War. And there was no salon during this time. There was very limited food. I read a really great book about Manet, not Monet, but Manet. That talked about like the rise of him and like why he painted the way he did. And it talks about artists um, dying in this war. So a lot of the, the like the friends of these artists died during this war, but also people living in, in um, Paris were reduced to like eating rats and cats because there were such food shortages in the city. And so a lot of these paintings were like the aftermath, like escapism. We don't want to show the hardship of war. We want to show like what we want life to be like. And like, of course, after the war, it's like, let's like live it up. And so a lot of the scenes are based on kind of living up in this new kind of form city that um, she mentioned in the video. So this is during the Industrial Revolution where people started to have consistent work hours. We start to see people working not 12 hours a day, but maybe like eight hours a day so that they have free time. They can enjoy the parks. They can enjoy the nightlife. They can have a life outside of working and outside of the home. And so a lot of the scenes are based on that. So here's all those different things that she shows you in the video. So, you know, park scenes, this is a boating scene where they're having kind of picnic, opera, street scenes, landscapes. They, you know, a lot of the artists raised in style, right? So here's um, Claude Monet, right? This is where the name Impressionist um, comes from, this Impression Sunrise. And so this tradition comes from um, looking at, um, uh, excuse me, um, what's his name? Rubens, right? So the sketchy sort of quality of Rubens. So this was not something necessarily that Claude Monet invented himself. He was just taking that expressive brushstroke that the Romantics love and taking it to another level, right? So can you tell what kind of did, well, name of my theory said it, it's called sunrise, but this is like the sun or sunset, I apologize, sunset. Um, so this is, you know, the color and light of sunset, right? Done really quickly. So Claude Monet was a big, big advocate for going outside and painting. So he was notorious for it. Here's a photo of him going outside and working. And so he did what we call plain air painting. And so this is one that's in our textbook and also that's um, at the Art Institute of Chicago. So this shows you one of his styles where it's more like flat sort of broad brushstrokes, 
right, rather than little dots of color. So once again, effects of light and color, notice how vivid and like the focus of this is kind of the lighting, right? So this is the image that's in the 250 for Claude Monet and for Impressionism. And it's a little different than some of the images that we saw in the video. What is it an image of? What is it an image of? Jeffrey, can you help me out? What's it an image of? Uh, is this like a train station? Exactly. So instead of being a scene of leisure or a park, it's a train station. And so by the time Monet was um, painted this painting, he was extremely popular. The French government gave him permission to kind of shut down this train station in the afternoon. So it wasn't like perfect community time. Like most people weren't using the trains in the afternoon. They're using it in the morning and then later in the afternoon to get home from like the suburbs of Paris or the countryside. And so he kind of shut it down for a couple of hours so that he could paint images of the trains. And so this one, right? Um, make sure we have our number here. 116, this is St. Lazare Station, which was new construction for the day. This was not the old train station. Of course, how old was the train station at this time? Anyway, um, but it was one of the newer train stations. And it has kind of newer architecture to it. So if you pay really close attention to it, you can see that it has wrought iron columns. You see the thin wrought iron columns? It reminds me of that fancy library that we saw in Paris, right? Where it has thin, delicate columns, and then the structure of the roof has wrought iron across it. And then notice it also has glass. So it was kind of a perfect location for him because it felt like he was inside and outside at the very same time. So he's really interested in light and weather and effects on time of color. So how does he create weather in a train station? How did the trains move during this time? Does anyone know? Anyone remember? What is the stuff coming up from the staff of the train? Alana, can you help me? Um, I'm not completely sure, but is it steam or smoke? It is. Remember in the Industrial Revolution, a lot of things were steam powered. And so that's water vapor coming out of the tops of the train. It would probably be a little bit too because they burn coal. But he was really interested in how the light that was coming through the glass, as well as coming through the interior, was how the color was changed based on the lighting. And so you notice on the ground, can you see the light coming through those windows at the top? And we call this dappling, where we have light and shadow. So you can see the crisscross pattern of the structure, right? You can see the crisscross pattern of the structure on the floor, right? As well as on you know some of these different people and uh, trains in the train station, right? So he was really interested in the new technology that steam engine. Um, this also reflects the time in which it was made because so many people were escaping the city to go into the French countryside. And so this was kind of like, like a life of more like leisure or escapism. Let's leave the hustle and bustle of the city and go enjoy nature, right? So these weren't like necessarily hardcore like hikers. They would go out with their parasols and their fancy dresses, their top hats, and go for leisurely walks in the countryside and drink and eat at cafes and, and escape city life. Right? So it's based on a series. He actually made four paintings based in, out of this train station. And so um actually. He did more than four, I apologize. Here's four of them. Um, it says he did between six and eight of them and exhibited them in 1877 in the Expressionist, um, Expressionist exhibit. Um, and some of them are a little bit more gray than others. So like this bottom one kind of seems like it's more of a foggy kind of overcast day, or maybe it's just a little bit more of like the soot of the cold. But when you look at the 
one that we had, notice the use of complementary colors. Does anyone know what complementary colors are? I'm going to pick on Kalana because I know she's taking some art classes. Hopefully she knows. Kalana? Are those the opposite colors? Exactly. They're opposite colors. So notice in the painting that we have, we've got the blues in the smoke and the sky. And then notice the orange in the um, buildings in the background, in the ground, in the light coming through, right onto the ground. And so he's juxtaposing blue with, with the warm orange. And so it really does play with the eye. And that was something that the Impressionists were doing um, in the late 1870s and 80s. Right, so time to reflect the trends of Impressionism, right? And to play on light. We can see the light through the smoke and the train shed. We can see how it's capturing a moment of time. It has kind of a snapshot uh, kind of feel to it. We have a contemporary scene. We have pastel colors as well as contrasting colors. And we have looser brush strokes. Really, if you look up here in the, um, in the shed, right? You can see some of that really loose brush strokes. It's almost like there's clouds inside the interior, but it's really loose and feathered. So she did a lot of this, so I'm not going to kind of skip through this really uh, fast, but he did a series of scenes, right? And so his are really based on time of day and weather. So you'll notice in his haystacks, of course, there's a bunch of them at the Chicago Art Institute. Um, you can see how they're different times of day, different seasons. Here's we got winter, early in the morning, springtime. Notice how bright and flowery the ground is, right? So you can see how he would take an idea and make many, many, many paintings based on that, that series. He went to different locations. Um, he, like I said, was really beloved by the French. And so he also built a, um, he actually bought some land, or I think actually the French government helped pay for it too. Um, he went outside of the city and he, Put his studio and his home outside the city. And so he loved Japanese art, and so he got himself a Japanese bridge. Um, here's a color photo of Monet. Um, so you can see him walking in his garden. So he actually grew flowers for himself to paint, and he had like ponds with lily pads. And you can go there today, um, Gen Z. Um, you can go there today and walk the, the same places he went and you know see the different scenes that he painted. And so in his later um, career, we don't have an image of him in the 250 from the later of his career, career, but how did his um, point of view change from this image of the lagoon to this image? How did his point of view change? Cora, can you help me? What's the difference between the one on the left and the right? They're both scenes of the same lagoon. Um, the one on the left is from kind of far away, and it's like looking at it kind of like the bridge straight on. And then the one on the right is kind of like close up and is looking straight at the water. Right. So sort of like what we saw with Stieglitz, right? He's kind of zooming in and looking at it more from like an aerial view. So he's like looking down from maybe the bridge, and he's only looking at the reflection of the sky on the water. And then, of course, the lily pads that float on the water. So his images in his later career were a lot of close-ups of the landscape. So you could see the sky. You could see reflection in the water, right? So it's another kind of different point of view. These are colossal paints. These are the orangery in Paris, which is kind of like this park greenhouse. And these cover the walls. They are so enormous. This one's at the Art Institute. You've probably seen this one before. This is not quite as long or as big. But you can see later in his life, his brushstroke becomes really, really rough. Um, he was painting into his 80s. Um, 
And so you can see kind of like his style evolve as well as his eyesight. Okay, so we're going to move on to our next impressionist theme. So our target is to see how impressionists challenge tradition of academic painting, focusing on domestic life. So here was Monet's style. We're going to skip that. Um, we're going to look at Calumet really fast um, and see how he's breaking away from impressionism. How is his work different than Monet? It's exactly thank you as well. It's much more refined. So notice how he's still concerned with light and shadow, right? Notice the water, like it just it just had rained. And so we see the reflections of light and shadow in the water that's accumulated on the cobblestone. We see the atmospheric perspective in the boulevard of Paris. And instead of using thick brush strokes, his style is much more refined and smooth. Right? So he did a lot of scenes on Parisian street life, and he loved the contemporary subject matter of like the bridges and the trains. And he did a lot of scenes based on windows. So kind of looking into these boulevards and style um, that existed in Paris, right? Another French artist, um, wrote, um, this is Fred War. And so looking at his images, he often suggested this idea of escapism. So there's always kind of like this party sort of atmosphere to his work. I love this one because of the dappling of color. So dappling is where the light is coming through the trees. And so you see this light and shadow everywhere. Notice how there's light and shadow on top of like the suit of this guy right here, right? The light's kind of shining in. And so it's almost like there's spots all over all these different images, right? So here's kind of like an outdoor cafe. This is a luncheon on a boat overlooking the sun. A lot of his, um, Paint and style kind of has like this peachy sort of skin tone, kind of feathery brush strokes. This is one of his more famous ones with these two sisters, right? Later on in his career, he rejects a lot of the impressionist artwork and goes back to the classical new. He's not the only one, right? right? So we're going to focus on those scenes of domestic life. Right? And this is Edgar Degas. Do you think Degas is more of a realist or an impressionist based on the style? What do you think? Realist or impressionist? You can throw it in the chat. Maybe you're right. This one of this really wealthy Italian family feels very realist. So a lot of you guys said realist. I would agree, especially on this one, right? So he's really known for these interesting compositions. And so when you look at his style and what the imagery he does, right? You notice that he does a lot of images of dancers. So Degas did a lot of images of dancers, and he was really good friends with um, with uh, Poussat, who's in the 250. And so they have a lot of similarities in their style because they work together a lot. Um, interesting enough, a lot of people call Degas kind of a misogynist, said he didn't like women. And one of the reasons of it is that typically the women in the scene seem somehow controlled by the men that are also in the scene. He tended to pick, when he was doing dancers, um, to be a dancer in this day was not necessarily, like people could become famous, but it wasn't necessarily something you wanted your children to become, right? Because it was nightlife, um, you were kind of like sometimes unescorted. Um, so often, um, it was kind of like a derogatory kind of feel to like being a dancer in this day. And so if you notice here, there's kind of like a conductor, like orchestrating the women here, right, telling them what to do. And then there's these men kind of sitting around watching the women, maybe their fathers or brothers or uncles, making sure they don't get into trouble. But he does a lot of casual things. So they always seem like they're kind of behind stage, kind of looking at practices, looking at um, interesting points of view. Notice how the ballerina on the right is like cut off. You can see kind of the influence of photography on his work. So 
here, instead of showing the point of view from, okay, I'm sitting in the audience looking at the, ball the ballet, I'm behind the scenes. He did acrobats, horse races. He was really interested in Japanese prints of the day. And so remember when we saw Hokusai, right? This is the same sort of style of printmaking that was becoming popular in Europe. And so a lot of the scenes that were coming from Japan during this time had an influence on not only the painting style, but of course the printmaking style of many of these artists. So they started to um, use patterning, right? So if I go back here, notice how in her kimono there's a sense of patterning. So in this day gap, you see that patterning on the wallpaper. Right? You see the interesting angle, the kind of point of view of looking at from above, sort of this oblique view. That was something that we saw in a lot of these prints from Japan, right? Even the subject matter of bathers, they got started showing. Um, not like classical bathers, but like women who looked like they were getting in or out of the bath. So it's more like the snap sort of snapshot sort of quality to it. Right? So still nude imagery, right? But different sort of feel. These are kind of the renegades of the day, like Degas versus, you know, Cabanel of the Academy. Do some of his later paintings. You can see how the colors become brighter as well. He also, in his old age, did a lot of sculptures when his eyesight were poor. So they typically have the same subject matter of dancers and bathers. Most of these were, I don't think any of these were exhibited in his lifetime. These are kind of like hidden in the studio. Okay. Um, the next artist that we're going to look at is in the 250, and this is Mary Passat. Um, in the video, they actually mentioned what her subject matter was. Um, does anyone remember what she was known for? I'm sure it was really quick, so you probably don't remember. But I'll show you some scenes here. All right, so this is Mary Cassatt, Mary Cassatt, Mary Cassatt, Mary Cassatt, Mary Cassatt, on the, on the right. So Mary Cassatt was a American, so she was an expatriate. She moved from the from Philadelphia area to Paris to live and work, and she was an upper class woman. And so her scenes basically reflect her status. So this image was painted where? What's this a scene of? Eva, what do you think? Where do you think the setting of this painting is? The opera. Exactly. That the region opera house that we saw when we looked at historyism is where she would often paint the scene. So I love this idea of it's kind of like people being seen. So people were like watching the opera, but they were also watching each other. So there's this guy over here is not looking at the screen. Basically, you see who's in the upper class boxes, right? What are they wearing? Who are they with? Right? She did a lot of scenes of children and mothers because it reflected her status, right? So what kind of imagery could a woman in the late 1800s paint, right? She never married, she never had children of her own, but she was kind of stuck in this niche of what would sell, right, as a female artist. So her artist style was normally women and children or mothers and their children, right? This one's at the Art Institute. I love this painting. It's kind of like from an oblique view, so from aerial view, kind of looking down. And you really see the influence of Japanese work in the patterning of the fabric of their clothing and the wallpaper and the carpeting and the strong outlines of the body, right? And so the image that we have in the 250 is inspired by these Japanese pictures um, that were being exported. And so this image we have, let's see, right? We have a coiffer, right? So this is the image that's in the 250. This is the last impressionist piece that we have in the 250 called the coiffer. Um, and I want to go back to this one here um, because it's very similar in style and in. Um, Technique. And this is an example of that Japanese, Japanese that was 
really common in the late 1800s. So how are they similar? Okay, one of the things that you notice is, especially in this bottom one, notice how soft kind of like the peachy tones are of the flowers in her rose. Now these prints were probably about like 100 years old by the time they start to get imported to Paris. Okay, get imported to Europe. And so their color naturally started to fade. And so a lot of artists emulated that faded sort of washed out color in their pictures, right? But they also included sort of that stereotypical subject matter. So the images of bathers or the use of patterning. So notice how there's patterning in the carpet here. Right? This one is like a train image by Cassatt, right? So here's our Kuiper image, right? So how is it impressionist in my animational box, right? When I look at this print, I don't think impressionism, right? I don't see expressionist mark making. I don't see a lot of layered colors. I don't see, you know, outdoor scenes, right? But it does have a lot of characteristics of impressionism, right? It has capturing a specific moment of time, right? It has kind of snapshot-like quality to it. Even though, like in the video, we didn't necessarily have snapshot quality during this time, right? We have an interior scene that is a domestic scene. So kind of like an interior intimate scene, right? It's based on reflection. So notice how she's fixing her hair in a mirror. Right, so we can see her from the back and we can see her from the front. So just like Monet was doing reflections in water, right? Um, the sun looking at the reflections in the mirror. And then we also have the influence of Japanese prints. So it doesn't have modeling like Renaissance painting. It's really flat. We have strong outlines to it, right? And then we have that flat, pastel, faded looking color. I also say that it has that patterning that's really common in Japanese work too. So the stripes, the patterning in the carpet, and then the wallpaper behind it. So we got faded color, strong contour lines, flat model, patterns. Those are all Japanese influences. Here's another example by Cassatt. Oh, there we go. Things I just said. Okay. So, why did she make these prints? Right? She did these in dry point with aqua tint. So, etching, right? Once again, is printing on metal. Aqua tint is where you apply colors to different sections. So you would basically rub different colors onto these different sections to get the color onto this print. So normally we think about, we look at etching and print just black on white paper. But this one has that aqua tint. Um, so it has kind of like a, a hazy sort of feel to it. So aqua tint, not only can you put color in certain sections, but it also has kind of like a, a simple kind of effect to it. So can you see how there's these different dark and light areas on this print block that I have right here? This is actually a piece of metal. And some of the areas are dark and some of them are light. It's basically where the acid has etched out different parts of it. And so the darker areas have more areas that are etched out. And the lighter areas have other areas that are a little less like more smooth metal. So you can change the value, but you can also rub different colors into these different sections, right? So she used this method as a way of producing artwork to be able to sell, right? So she was making hundreds of these different prints between the summer and fall of 1890 and 1891 as a way of um, promoting herself because she could sell to the larger art market. Right, to make her art more um, acceptable and cheaper to a larger audience. So she was a painter, but also she did these prints. So what 
is she doing, right? Um, a little bit more of the sunset, she's fixing her hair. We have a lot of Japanese prints of the same day doing exactly the same thing. I should say at the same time here. Of an earlier time period, but they were common in this time period. Right? And so notice how her nude image is handled differently than what we saw with Le Grand Adolescent, right? She's not over sexualized. She's not she's not there for like the male gaze. This just happens to be what she's doing at this moment of time, right? So Kasatsu's capturing a random moment of this woman dressing in the morning. Um, Bert Morse Mor Morso was another female painter, and she did a lot of interior scenes as well. She too was an upper class woman. Um, her and her sisters trained to be painters um, at an early age. A lot of women were. It was something that made you more refined, but most women gave it up when they got married. She did not. She actually married the uh, brother of Manet, not Monet, but Manet. And so she painted throughout the rest of her life. And she would do a lot of scenes of herself with her children or her sisters with their children. And her style is very similar to Cassatt. But there's some there's a few differences that help me be able to see the differences. Can you see any visible differences between these two scenes of mother and daughter? What's a characteristic that you see that looks different between the two? Jasmine, can you help me out? Do you see any differences? Um, the um, one on the left, we like kind of look at them from a different point of view. We actually get to see more of them because of the mirrors. Right. So she's got like more of an interesting point of view. It's kind of like that aerial view where you can see what's the other reflection behind her. Does anyone else see another kind of characteristic that's different between the two? Emily, you see one? Um, well, the one on the right seems to, like, use more highlights, I guess, or, like, it uses, like, white to, like, emphasize. I don't know. Yeah, this one has really bright and thick mark making. So you saw a lot of white, and it's not blended as much. So if we go back to, like, this scene here of this park scene, notice how visible the brushstroke is of more so, right? When I look at the sock, a lot of her imagery is like much more like smooth and refined. It doesn't mean that we see a lot of smooth mark making, but like the mark making is smaller, so your eye visually mixes it. But a lot of more so artwork, she's got almost like this electric sort of quality, it's like lightly bold of mark making and very loose, right? So she's she showed her work up until that end, that very last impressionist exhibit in 1886. This is Cavalette's domestic scene. He was the guy who did the scene that we saw um, of like the, the streets, but he did a lot of male nudes, which I found is interesting, that he was you know, really reversing um, the role that we normally see of like female bathers and was doing nude bathers of the day, um, men, male nude bathers of the day, right? So that's where we're gonna end for today. Um, on Thursday, we'll start looking at the post-impressionist. So we have all this knowledge that's gained for like 20 years of a precious painting. And some of these guys are gonna pass away, right? Some of these women are going to um, keep working and men are gonna keep working and they're gonna influence the next generation. That's what we're gonna start and look at on Thursday. Sound good? Okay. I'll see you guys later.